On your Monday episode of Locked On Raptors, I don't think anyone's expecting these Toronto Raptors to be particularly good at defense, but could they at least try? You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? And welcome to another episode of Locked On Raptors, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Monday, April the 1st, and I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for 10 seasons on various platforms. You can follow my work over on the website that sucks, at Woodley Sean. You can find the show on Instagram at Locked On Raptors, and you can join us, of course, over on the Locked On Raptors Discord server. The link is in the description of the podcast. It's free to join, as always, and it's a great little place to come hang out with sickos just like you, who are the real April Fools still watching this basketball team. Uh, Come hang out with other fools just like you. It's a lovely, lovely place. Free to join, as always. Always, we're not just talking Raptors either. We're talking about March Madness. We're talking about uh, food and movies and all sorts of good stuff to keep you distracted from the on-court product the Raptors keep on throwing out there. Uh, of course, you can find the show for free wherever you get your podcast. Follow, subscribe, rate, review, tell a friend. Always appreciated when you support the show. However, you support the show, we are on YouTube as well. You can go and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the little notification bell. And get a heads up every single time. The show is about to premiere via push notification. That's a great thing because you get a heads up when I'm talking and everyone wants that, right? 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 All right. On today's show, we are digging into a Toronto Raptors 135-120 loss to the Tyrese Maxey, Joel Embiid-less Philadelphia 76ers. Lots of Kyle Lowry. We'll talk about Kyle coming up later on in the show just a little bit uh we're gonna get into bruce brown who had himself a nice game and frankly i think is making a case for uh just keeping him around if you can't find a move for him this summer we'll dive into that a little further plus uh you know all the good bad hmm, fun we'll get to but i want to start off with the defense in this game and look all caveats are understood there is not a lot of defensive talent on this basketball team right now. Kelly Olenek is basically their only workable big. Apologies to Mohamedou Gay. And he's not an especially good defensive player. We know this, but... I found myself, you know, in the midst of like a lot of people, you know, in the Raptors, Locked on Raptors Discord, I had like friends and family messaging me being like, hey, this wasn't such a bad game. I was kind of scratching my head because this did not feel in any way like any sort of moral victory type of game to me. You know, I'm I love moral victories. I'm happy to, you know, settle with a loss that has some positive signs. I just didn't really feel like they were there in this game. You know, obviously, this was one of the better offensive games the Raptors have played in a while because they've not played really any good offensive games in, in any recent stretch. To score 120 points with this team is kind of a miracle. But they did it against the Sixers team that, again, had no no Joel Embiid again, no Tyrese Maxey, and was closing this game with, like, Tobias Harris as their nominal center. I would hope that players in the NBA could score points on this Sixers team in this game. It's on the defensive end against a, li- a lineup that featured campaign and Mo Bamba in the starting five and, you know, 10 minutes of K.J. Martin and a whole lot of Paul Reed and five minutes of Jeff Doughton. You would think that maybe you could string together like a few stops against the Sixers team and not give up 30 plus in every single quarter. But no, this Raptors team was not capable of slowing down this Sixers offense in any way, shape or form. And so, yeah, sure. Jordan Wara has a nice night, scores 8, 19 points on 8 of 18 shooting, classically efficient from him. Um, You know, you have Javon Freeman Liberty gets to 11 on pretty inefficient shooting. Yeah, Bruce Brown has a nice game. Like, I don't really care about the offensive stuff in this game. You should have scored points against the Sixers team. You also should have been able to, like, halfway defend the Sixers team, even in this skeleton roster state. And I just found it, like, a very disappointing game to watch. Like, Just if we can just for a moment have a moment of silence for all of the Toronto Raptors who died on screens in this game against the Sixers, we'll have that now. We don't want too much dead air, so that's the moment. And then also, like, we don't need to like mourn those guys that much because, uh, like they, they, they just there's just no fight on the defensive end right now. And look, like, again, I know that they're not super talented at the moment, they're without Scotty Barnes and Jakob Pertle, their two best defensive players. Emmanuel Quickly and R.J. Barrett, even if they're not great defenders, are more passable than a lot of the guys they're rolling out right now. 
quickly in particular as like a rotational guy, a shot contester, etc. Uh, it's just to me, the guys who are fighting for jobs on this team, the guys who are trying to stick around long term, the Jordan Waras, the Gary Trent Juniors, the Kobe Simmonses, the Javon Freeman Liberties. These are the guys who, you know, Jalen McDaniels, these are guys who are trying to carve out roles on next year's team on the next serious Toronto Raptors team. And all of them can score. We know this. Every NBA player, given room to cook, can score. That's why they're in the NBA. But for these guys in particular, like all of these guys are fighting for jobs on next year's Raptors team, where the thing they're going to have to do to be viable contributors to help bring the whole thing together around Scotty, Yach, IQ, RJ is they're going to have to defend. We know this team is light on high-end defensive talent after the moves of this season, and they're looking for guys who can fill in those gaps, who can be there and be a 6'8 wing who can stand in and not get blown by like a turnstile, a.k.a. Jordan Wara, right? Like, you're, you're looking for guys who can show a little bit of nastiness on that end. You know, the guy who I think I've just been, like, yearning for all season long is Vince Williams with the Memphis Grizzlies. They're bad. They stink. They're 28th in defense since March 1st. The Raptors are 29th. Like, it's not like the Grizzlies are any great shakes. But Vince Williams is a maniac. Vince Williams is, like, a, an absolute stud on the defensive end. And he tries. That Grizzlies team tries. I sh I, I'm wrong. They're 24th in, in defense, 29th in offense. Uh, not very good. Um, but their defense is, like, you know, not good. But they're actually passable and, you know, throwing guys out there who are actually kind of giving a damn. And for me... I'm just not seeing much of that with this Raptors team. Sure, you know, there's some high-flying stuff on offense. We've seen some nice dunks here and there. But on the defensive end, like, just like it's the little effort things. It's not even the stuff that requires immense defensive talent or length or athleticism. It's fighting through screens. The number of times a Raptor just fell apart on a screen or got hung up on a screen was just, like, uncountable in this game. It's just it's every single time a screen gets set, the guy who is being screened is lost from the play, leaving Kelly Olynyk on an island to, to defend. You know, I think there's just way too much in terms of conceding easy switches with this team right now. This is not a team that boasts like multi-positional defenders across the board. What I'd like to see, and, you know, I'm not sure if this is a coaching thing. I'm not sure if this is just players. If it's a coaching thing, I, I, I don't want it to be that going forward. I would hope that there's a little bit more sort of, you know, especially with this team, guys trying to fight, like encourage guys to fight through screens, encourage guys to not just die and concede the switch. That's a nice thing to do when you have, again, like a, a lineup where everyone can switch and hang on every type of position. But that's not what this Raptors team right is right now. And you're trying to build good habits, right? You're trying to build something. You're trying to build some kind of defensive identity. And this team is not at all, you know, giving any sort of extra effort to fight through uh, dudes who are in the way on, on defense. Their rotations are short. They're they're slow. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of defending the initial action. They're just like hoping and praying that someone will miss on the back end. The Sixers didn't do that in this game. The Sixers shot 16 of 27 on wide open threes in this game. Per NBA.com, 42 of their 43 threes were either open or wide open per their tracking data. And yes, that's noisy, but it's also extreme. And noisy data can also often be kind of indicative of stuff if it's very extreme. And the Raptors just like conceding threes to the Sixers team, which rained threes on their head all night without much impunity. Like that's that that's on them in, in large part. Yeah, there's some shooting variance there. There's some luck, obviously, but there's also just like a lack of intense rotation going on here. You're seeing Jordan Wara get blown by every single time he's sized up by a smaller guard, by a wing, whatever it is. He can't stay in front of anybody. You're just you're missing all of the sort of small little things that you would hope that a team full of guys trying to stake their claim to jobs in the NBA would at least be throwing their themselves into, right? Like that's just not what we're seeing right now. And so yeah, you score 120 points on the Sixers. I, I don't care because you gave up 138.9 offensive rating to a Sixers team that without Embiid and Maxi on the floor together this season has had like 111 offensive rating. It's like a 29th percentile offense in the league without Embiid and Maxi, and you just let them go for nearly 140 points per 100 possessions. It's pathetic. Like, it frankly, is it's just. I, I can't get on the moral victory train here because they kept this one over within single digits in the fourth quarter, considering the way they were scoring in this game, just like a little bit of defensive resistance probably gets them a win and gets them off the 13 game losing streak. There aren't moral victories when you've lost 13 in a row and your season has completely fallen 
into a state of unwatchability. Uh, it's just, I, I know I sound like a grump here, but you're trying to look at stuff for next season. You're trying to find those positives, those little inklings of, ooh, there could be something there. And none of these guys who are fighting for these back-end jobs are, are doing anything to really convince me they belong on a serious version of this Raptors team. It's tough, man. Like, it's just, I don't really care about the 19 points for Jordan War. I really don't because he is one of the worst individual defenders I think I've ever seen play basketball for the Toronto Raptors. It's it's tough stuff. Even Gary Trent Jr. Like, we know Gary Trent Jr. can score. He scored 23 points on 20 shots last night. A pretty Gary game. But, like, is he going to try to fight over a screen? Is he going to, like, kind of mix it up and do his defensive thing? Like, he's had stretches of late where it's happened. Didn't feel like it was there at all last night. Just a total lack of resistance. And, again, there's only so much Kelly Olynyk can do. He's not been helping matters by any means, but he's also the only big on the team right now. They're, you know, putting him on an island. They're forcing these switches where he's guarding smaller, quicker guys he can't stay in front of. Um, or he's in drop coverage and just kind of can't man the in-between there. There's lobs going over his head all the time. He's part of this as well, but he also offers like tangible things that are going to help next year's team when they're at full health. He's going to be more insulated defensively, one would assume. These other guys who are fighting for the scraps, fighting for those ninth, 10th, 11 spots on next year's team in the rotation, like defense is going to have to be a thing they bring to the table. And right now, no one outside of maybe Javon Freeman Liberty for some stretches is really giving me all that much. And so, uh, yeah, disappointing, disappointing stuff. I, I, I just cool. You scored 120 on Tobias Harris backline rim protector. Good for you. Um, we'll come back on the other side, get into a guy who did have a good game in this one and a guy who I keep on thinking is maybe getting a bit of a bad rap and is maybe better kept in Toronto beyond this summer then moved on from or declined. We'll get into Bruce Brown and the case for keeping him around after a pretty nice game for him coming up in just one second. Today's show is brought to you by friends over at Prize Picks, the single best place to play daily fantasy sports with more than 3 million members. It is super fun, super easy. All you got to do is pick more or less on two or more player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. March is over, but the biggest moments in college basketball are they're coming in the month of April, of course. You get the final four for the men's side. You get the women's side. The, the Elite Eight is just like an absolute banger of incredible matchups all around. You're going to want to go and check it out. Get it on the playoff action. Win up to 100 times your money on prize picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason. Of course, the NBA playoffs coming up very, very soon as well. Playoffs begin April 20th, playing around April 16th, 17th, 18th. Right now, you can win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with those little four correct picks. You can turn 10 bucks into $1,000 with basketball, hockey, and college basketball entries today on prize picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Download the app today. Use the code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com or download the app and go to use the code locked on NBA when you do that for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. We continue on here with your first listen of the day. Thanks so much for hanging out. Talking about a Raptors 135 120 loss to the Philadelphia 76ers in a game. Uh, that I guess some people felt all right about from, you know, just my various looking at Raptors online, but uh, I don't feel good. I'm sick of watching the team not win games. And, and just sort of to put a bow on the, the sort of thought before, when it comes to like Darko Ryakovich, I, I do think the sort of biggest question I have based on this season is like, what is his idea on defense? And obviously he hasn't had the personnel to implement much this year. The personnel has been different. They have changed the team a thousand times over, over the course of 82 games. I don't expect that there would be like a great defensive infrastructure in place right now, but I am fascinated to see like with players on the team from day one who are going to be on the team with Jakob Pertl as the backline rim protector with Scotty Barnes taking steps forward. Like what is the plan here on defense? That is, I think probably my biggest Darko Ryakovich question coming out of this year. I have no questions about his offense. I think the offense is going to be probably above average next year with health. Um, but the defense still remains a question mark. And obviously that's on personnel too. The front office has to go get some dudes who can defend, please. Some wings who can defend, please. Um, anyway, that's just my last thought there. Let's get into uh, Bruce Brown, shall we? Last night, really a tidy game for him. Seven of nine from the field, 18 points, four boards, six assists, two steals, uh, three of four from downtown as well. Nice to see him getting the Jimmy going from deep. And look, I, it's not gone well with Bruce Brown. 
I know this. He's been a lightning rod of sorts. He's been someone who, uh, you know, has kind of drawn a lot of ire. He's part of a trade that I think was bad and unnecessary. I, I, I still maintain they did not have to do the Pascal Siakam trade after acquiring Emmanuel quickly and RJ Barrett for OG Ananobi. We could don't have to relitigate that, but you know, I think the fact that Bruce Brown is one of the returns in that deal is something that you know is just kind of a sore spot, right? It's like picking at a scab. It's like, ah, oh, that thing reminds me of that thing that happened to me, right? It, it's just you don't love it. That said, just because it hasn't gone super well with Bruce Brown yet doesn't mean that it can't go well. And I am coming around on the idea that it's probably just best if they can't find like a trade where he is used as salary matching in a deal that gets you a serious upgrade. Like Bruce Brown plus picks is kind of an interesting theoretical trade package for whomever this offseason. The number of picks will vary depending on who it is you're targeting, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, I got my eye on wings. There's this team needs wings. They need wing defense. They need size. They need length. The guys who can fill in the gaps defensively on this team in between some not so great defenders on the perimeter and quickly and Barrett, although again, quickly, I think is fine. Um, you know, if Bruce Brown can be your avenue to that, plus some picks attached. Great. I think that's awesome. But if that's not there, I think there's this sort of thinking that, oh, they'll just, they'll just decline his contract. They won't bring him back next year at the 21 mil or whatever he's making. And they'll go to the cap space route. I kind of don't know if I want to go the cap space route. The more you look at the free agent class, the more it bums you out, uh, at least I'm speaking from my own experience. I'm not sure if you have dabbled the same as I have, but it's like not a very good free agent class. It's just the way it is. If they had the cap space to go and throw it at Paul George, sure. But like that's not going to happen. Paul George is not coming to a very bad Toronto Raptors team. He's going to the Sixers if he's going anywhere, probably. Um, he probably just sticks around in L.A. We'll see what the playoffs bring. Either way, like... If there was that sort of big, gigantic addition you could go make with a bounty of cap space, I'd be all over it. But I just don't think that's there. I talked about Malik Monk. He's interesting. As a talent play, it's not bad. But I do think defensively, the team would just be really, really bad. And I don't want to watch a really bad defensive team anymore. I want to watch a team that actually has a chance of stopping modern NBA offense, which is does not have, have had all season long. Um, that's out of a couple of brief flourishes here and there. I think with Bruce Brown you know, declining him and going the cap space route, like you're opening up a whole lot of uncertainty. Whereas if you just keep Bruce Brown and pay Gary Trent Jr., you avoid the cap space route. You stay as an over-the-cap team. You have the mid-level exception to work with to hopefully throw it a wing of the likes of, I don't know, Najee Marshall or Caleb Martin, something like that. Like, I think that might just be the better way to build a full and coherent roster than hoping to go and sign some big ticket free agent with cap space, which they don't even have as much cap space as they were projected for because they signed Kelly Olynyk, et cetera, et cetera. I just, the cap space thing seems like less of a viable path to me. And so if you can't find a real trade for Bruce Brown at the draft, I think there's a real case to keep him around. You need connective basketball players to play coherent basketball. Um, you know, the Raptors have some of those in Kelly Olynyk and Jakob Pertl, but like a guard who can also be a connector for you, pretty good. I, I think they haven't used Bruce Brown especially well so far this season. I think there are ways to use him. I think um, that second unit they had him running with, with Ochai Abaji and Kelly Olynyk and Scotty Barnes and Grady Dick, like there's something there, whether it's Brown as the sort of point guard or Brown is like a, a screening and diving small ball five with Olynyk spacing out. Like, I think there's something there to work with. We know that Bruce Brown is really effective in that role in particular as the small ball guy who can make plays on the short roll. And if you can surround him with some size and some shooting, there's something interesting going on there, I think. Um, you know, we saw some quick chemistry right out of the gate with him and Scotty Barnes. I didn't get to tap into it a ton because Scotty got hurt and all of that. But I, I do think there, that second unit had some legs to it, given some more run. And so I just... Because I don't think the cap space route's going to bear a whole lot of fruit, I just think I'd rather have Bruce Brown and Gary Trent Jr. on the team than X free agent they could potentially go sign. And again, like if you go get Malik Monk, talent upgrade, sure, Monk is better on your team than Brown plus Trent, but you're banking on being the one team that signs Malik Monk in a league of 30 in a league where like 10 teams are going to have cap space. You know, you, you have to, it's a big risk, like playing for cap space. We know this, the Raptors played for cap space with Giannis and got burned for it. And in some ways are still paying the price for it. And so I, I just, I don't love selling out 
your whole plan to go and sign a free agent. It's just not how this Raptors team is ever going to be built, how it's ever been built. And frankly, it's not how teams build in the modern NBA either. It's just, it's via trade, it's via draft, and it's, you know, via internal development is how teams get better. It, it, free agency is a, is a nice little luxury that a handful of teams have real access to. And, you know, most of the time, stars are going to pick their destinations anyway via trade. And so I, I just... I think Brown is useful. I think he's a good player. I don't think he's the sort of misshapen, out of sorts player he's looked like since arriving in Toronto. We've seen him be a closer on a championship team in the last year. And I think there's some serious value to that. And again, I continue to maintain that Bruce Brown will be better on a well-functioning, healthy version of this Raptors team than right now where he's spread too thin. He's playing 30 plus minutes a game. He's being asked to run point a lot of the time. Like, that's tough. It's just not a role that you want for Bruce Brown. But on this team where he can be a seventh or eighth guy with an ascendant Scotty Barnes, an ascendant RJ Barrett, Emmanuel Quickly, Yaka Pertle, Kelly Olynyk to take away some playmaking duties. Like, I think there's something there where he can fit into a team and be helpful. And I do think that if you're going to trade Bruce Brown, if you're just trying to offload him for a pick, like at this year's draft, you maybe get a second for him. At the deadline next year, maybe you you build his value back up and there's a first to be had. And if not, maybe he just walks and you get the cap relief next summer. I, I don't think that's a bad thing either. I, I just think, you know, moving on from him this summer just because ah he hasn't been very good for a few months is kind of a short-sighted way to look at it. And I, I think he can offer value to this team next season if he's here. And again, my number one sort of option with Bruce Brown would be find a deal for him, trade him plus stuff for an upgrade. That is what I think this team should be doing. I think they're in the position having Scotty Barnes quickly and Barrett all in place where they're looking to fill in around them and create a team, a functioning, cohesive team that makes geometrical sense on the floor that has the skill sets you need across the board. If you can go find a wing for Bruce Brown and some picks, that is like the dream outcome. But of course, it's always less likely that a trade will happen than it is for it to not happen. And so I, I think it, it's just, you know, if, if push comes to shove and you get to the draft, you haven't moved Bruce Brown, and you're staring down the decision of, ooh, do we decline his option and just get the cap space route going and maybe renounce Gary Trent Jr. and try to go that way? I don't think you can really have your cake and eat it too. Like, I think if you're renouncing Bruce Brown and signing Gary Trent Jr., your cap space is gone anyway, if I'm not mistaken, or it's pretty close to null and void. So it's kind of a you keep both or you keep neither situation to me a little bit. And at this point, considering how the market's looking, considering like what those guys can do to be complimentary players on a team that has all of its players available, which they certainly don't right now, I think there's something there with Bruce Brown to offer. And whether he's helping next year's team just be more competent or he's just someone you move at the deadline, I, I think there's a reason to keep him around through this, through the draft and through his uh, guaranteed date. Um, so we'll see, but yeah, I, I think I'm coming around on just keep Bruce Brown. Don't get silly with it. Don't get cute with the cap space thing, barring a trade, just keep him around and have him be a useful player for you. Cause he can absolutely be that as we saw last night against the Sixers where he was probably their best player. Um, you know, get that floater game going when that floater game is going, it's fun. And it hasn't been going a ton, but I do love Bruce Brown's weirdo floaters off balance. They're uh, a fun little wrinkle in what the Raptors roll out there. We'll come back on the other side. We'll round it up with the good, the bad, and the hmm. We'll send you off into the rest of your Easter Monday. We'll do that coming up in just one sec. Today's show is brought to you by Amazon Fire TV. I love Fire TV because my parents use it, and they never have to call me for troubleshooting. It is the answer to technologically deficient parents. We love it. I love you, Mom and Dad. I'm sorry to be using you as an example in this ad read. Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick. That's what my parents got that you can plug into your existing TV, provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes as well as free and live TV. That includes Locked On, of course, as well as most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive into all of the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up on upkeep up to date and all the latest world well, latest in the world of sports me oh my march madness nba mlb lots more not to mention great news entertainment gaming travel cooking videos as well check out fire tv on fire fire tv channels on fire tv and alexa devices if you haven't checked out fire tv channels you should trust me on this to learn more visit amazon.com slash locked on fire tv 
All right, uh, rounded up the show here on your Monday, breaking down the Raptors' loss to the Philadelphia 76ers, 135-120. And we'll round it out with the good, the bad, and the hmm, the way we wrap every episode on the heels of a Toronto Raptors basketball game, of which there are mercifully only eight left this year. Also, heads up, uh, prompted by a very good uh, Discord question by, I can't remember who sent it in. Uh, there will be an episode or a series of episodes after the season where we just go all good, all bad, all hmm. It'll be a full season review of the good, the bad, and the hmm of the Toronto Raptors season. But uh, without that on deck just yet, let's get to today's game, uh, or last night's game against the Sixers. The good for me, that Kyle Lowry still doing this at 38, it brings me so much damn joy to watch him continue to be annoyingly smart and savvy and Kyle Lowry about every damn thing he does, taking charges, poking balls loose, pull up transition threes. We love Kyle Lowry. Uh, it, it's just, he's a delight. He has brought me more joy as a basketball fan than any player in NBA history. I could watch Kyle Lowry be Kyle Lowry on the floor all day long. And to see him doing it for Philly, it's weird. It's strange. It's a little strange seeing him in like a blue jersey. Um, it, it throws you off a little bit. But uh, he's still very much Kyle Lowry. Extremely recognizable in terms of the stuff he does on the floor. 11 points, 10, board, 10 assists last night. Just like, what a treat. We love Kyle Lowry and uh, happy he's still getting to cook with a team that hopefully gets their guys back and is pretty serious. It'd be cool to see him go on a run. Although it is a little bittersweet to see him doing it with Nick Nurse and all that stuff. Uh, it was also truly shocking. There was one point in this game where Kelly Olynyk posted up Kyle Lowry and uh, scored easily. It was very strange. Kind of a passage of time thing a little bit. Watching Kyle Lowry unable to guard a post up. Uh, not something we've often seen in these parts. But shout out to Kelly for scoring on the best post defender of the last 20 years. Uh, sorry, Draymond Green. I'm biased here. Let's go to the bad. The bad is nothing to do with this game, really, because like we talked about it. The defense was bad, and it was bad from a lot of guys. So I'm not going to rail on Jordan Wara's inability to stay in front of a guy anymore. Um, but the bad for me is just like the general sentiment around the team from fans I talked to. Saw a lot of people this weekend. Uh, it was at the Raptors Republic three on three tournament over the weekend. That was a ton of fun. Saw lots of great pals, lots of listeners, lots of, um, you know, Raptors Republic geniuses, pod guests, past and future, etc. cetera. Um, you know, I saw family for Easter stuff and, you know, lots of Raptors fans in the family and just like a lot of Raptors fans in my life, a lot of people who like ostensibly work covering the team in my life who are just like universally checked out on this whole thing. And it's a bummer of a place to be for an entertainment product, for a thing that has brought Raptors fans so much joy over the last 10 years or so. There's been so much good. This season has been a real step back. And really, this is when I talk about, you know, the damaging toll of wasting seasons of tanking. And again, I know the Raptors right now, their tank is partly imposed by injury and personal tragedy. So I get it. But when you talk about lost seasons like this, like this is the stuff that causes fan base atrophy. This is the stuff where you lose the, the casuals on the prim, on, on the fringes of the fan base, where they turn their eyes towards something else, where they become Leaf fans or Blue Jays fans, or just like don't watch basketball at all. It makes the conversation around the team a bummer as opposed to something that should be exciting and fun and a shared common interest. It's just like, I, again, I know a lot of it's out of their control, but to have this now be a, a second season of the last four that's been kind of lost, it, it's it's a bummer. And like they just, I continue to maintain they cannot afford to be this bad next year. They really can't. Like this is just, they're too serious a franchise. They have title pixie dust. Serious franchises don't go into the tubes for multiple seasons. They figure out a way out of it. And I, I think the Raptors need to like do some serious franchise stuff this summer to find their way back towards competitiveness to at least being like a top eight team in the Eastern conference next season. And I think it's there for them. And frankly, I think the goal should be maybe not to this extreme because the Rockets have won 11 games in a row. But if you can be like the Rockets where you're on the fringes, maybe you're not like any great shakes, but you have some moments where you surprise where you look like, Ooh, this is like a fun team on the rise. And you have the capacity to go on a late season heater like that should be the aspirational goal for next season for this team. And like, I love that the Rockets didn't just pack it in when they lost a bunch of games and were out of the playoffs and Alperin Sengun went down. They said, no, like we're going to go and try to like build something here still and keep our guys in and actually push. 
And they did. And it's awesome. And they're giving their fans like something to truly get excited about. And so I just think, you know, there's the general vibe of talking to people who like this team, who love this team, who all they want to do is talk about and love this team. Just a grim scene right now, man. Like it's just, it's a bummer. And hopefully this is just a brief little blip on the radar in an otherwise pretty successful run here with Scotty Barnes at the helm. But uh, you can't afford another year like this, man. You cannot afford lost seasons. They just, you, you're not the, the Hornets. You're not the Wizards. You're a more serious, legitimate franchise than those teams are. You have to act like it. You can't just like, oh, well, I guess we're just down in the tubes for a while. Like, no, like do something to take control of your situation and get out of it, whether it's a big swing for a, a player, whether it's, um, you know, I, I don't know. There's just, like just building upon what the good parts were this year, leaning into those, like I, whatever it is next year has got to be more serious. This, cause I, I want to like be at the Raptors Republic tournament and like enjoy talking to people about the team. Is that such a crazy dream to have? Um, anyway, just a thought from talking to a lot of Raptors fans, at various things this, uh, this summer, this weekend, um, everyone's bummed. Everyone's very excited for baseball season. And that's not a place you want to be. I love baseball, but I would like to be more invested in the basketball for the next little stretch. Um, my, hmm, to close out the show is tied to the Bruce Brown thing, tied to the Gary Trent Jr. thing. It's kind of like a would you rather, and I'm curious sort of what the comments would say about this. Um, maybe I'll put pitch this to someone when, when I have a guest on the show to kind of throw st throw stuff off of later in the week. But um, but Buddy Heald, he's an expiring deal. He's going to be a free agent this summer. It seemed like his market was going to be a lot more robust, but he's only been kind of huh, for the Sixers so far. And he is kind of like Gary Trent Jr., Pretty one-dimensional guy, right? Like, not a great defender, bombs threes like a maniac. I think he's a way more dynamic player than Gary Trent Jr., has a bit more playmaking chops, etc. cetera. Um, like, I think I'd rather have Buddy Heald on my team than Gary Trent Jr., although it's close. And I guess, you know, the power of having bird rights makes it so Gary Trent Jr. is, you know, he's just more likely to be around, obviously. But um, I do think it's an interesting sort of what if. Like, what if the Raptors were to not pick up Bruce Brown's option, decline it, way or re re renounce gary Trent jr's bird rights not bring him back go the cap space route and sign buddy healed and then also throw a minimum cheap contract for a one-year retirement tour deal at kyle lowry let's just say that like it, let's just because i can't quit my dudes uh what, what if they were to be sort of like a, okay you swap out bruce and gary Trent jr bring in uh, uh, an upgrade, I think, in Buddy Heald over Gary Trent Jr., then probably a slight downgrade in Kyle Lowry versus Bruce Brown, although uh, that feels sacrilege to say, and maybe it's not. I don't know. Having just like a sage veteran backup point guard might not be the worst thing in the world for this team. Um, someone for Emmanuel quickly to learn from, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I think there would be certain upsides if you were able to convince Kyle Lowry to spend his last year on a middling team at best. Um, maybe that's enough. I don't know. But Maybe that maybe you're rooting for the Sixers to win the title this year, so he feels accomplished enough to just come back and close it out with the Raptors for a season. I don't know, but either way, just the sort of what if of if you could swap out Bruce Brown and Gary Trent Jr. for Buddy Heald and Kyle Lowry, is that something you'd do? I, I know this is just kind of like a segment we're doing on the show now, where the Raptors play a team, and I look at their pending UFAs and say, "Oh, what about that guy?" But I mean, it seems like as good a topic development thing i could be doing at the moment uh and so i think it's a fascinating one i think i you know i'm not super keen on buddy healed but i do think his spacing and, and sort of the dynamism he brings is pretty huge and like i think he would be an upgrade in the starting five over gary Trent jr defensively kind of a wash and i think he's just like a slightly more uh terrifying three-point shooter that kind of makes defenses worry a little bit more I think his self-creation is a little bit more interesting as well. He can create for others way better, like twice the the assist numbers of Gary Trent Jr. typically. And so I, I think that's an interesting one. You know, again, it's not a long-term solution. It's probably like a shorter deal for Buddy Heald. But, um, you know, if you're looking at a stopgap to kind of keep things competitive, keep the team functioning and healthy and, and able to produce decent basketball next year, and you don't want to have Gary Trent Jr. around for two, three years, I do wonder if maybe like a, you know, if you have the cap space, a one-year balloon payment to Buddy Heald, maybe you make him like a trade asset like the Pacers did with Bruce Brown too. There's something there. Uh, or like a couple-year deal, whatever it is. Uh, plus, a, again, a, a cheap retirement tour deal for Kyle Lowry. Might not be the worst thing in the world. Just a thought as we round out the show.
Uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks for supporting the show. As always, really appreciate anyone who's still sticking with it. Lots of you still are. You're all maniacs, and I love each and every one of you maniacs. You're the best. Uh, and we'll continue on with draft coverage. We're going to hopefully get Richard Stamen from Locked on NBA Big Board on this week, so we'll sort that out um, and have a, a good little chat about the draft and what's going on there. Um, and we'll, uh, yeah, we got Vivek coming back tomorrow. We'll probably play a little game with him, maybe a little Would You Rather or something like that, a little What's More Likely, something along those lines to keep things fresh. Uh, as we continue on this week and talk about the games, talk about the draft and everything else there is. Thank you as always for supporting the show. We'll be back again on Tuesday for another episode of Lockdown Raptors. Thanks for hanging. Bye-bye. Mm.